everybody. Welcome to the Homework is Podcast. And we are really excited today. Today we have a bonus episode of the podcast where we are ranking persuasion movies. This is going to be really fun. I'm a big Jane Austen fan. And, uh, and I'm always curious to see what uh, the film adaptations uh, have to offer. We have a new film adaptation uh, coming out this week uh, from uh, over at Netflix. And so we thought it was perfect time to rank four different versions of Persuasion. And I'm film critic Rachel Wagner. And today we have a very special guest uh, with us. Uh, Esther Hatch is here. And uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's always fun. I think this is your fifth time coming on. I know. I just love coming back so much. <laughs> and last time we had you on was for our uh, romantic reading wrap up. Uh, we were with me and Bree. We we're talking uh, books. So that oh. was really fun. Uh, and for people that have missed your other times on, why don't you uh, tell uh, our audience a little bit about yourself and the books that you write? Yeah, so I'm an author. I write Regency and Victorian romances. I first published in 2018, so I've been doing it for a few years now. Um, and I specialize in kind of like the cleaner uh, romances without too much steamy heat, mm -hmm. but hopefully a little bit of, you know, spice that is fun. <laughs> yeah. What attracted you to Regency period uh, in for your writing? Well, I definitely was someone who grew up as a reader, not a writer. I think some writers write their whole life and are mm -hmm. really devoted to that. But I just love Jane Austen's books from the time I was a teenager. Um, and then also Elizabeth Gaskell is a favorite, mm -hmm. Charlotte Brown, Jane Eyre. So uh, just that time period has always been like my very favorite books were written then. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Do you remember the first Jane Austen you ever read? I don't have a memory of which one it was. I mean, it was probably Pride and Prejudice, but I know I read them all. My family had like no TV pretty much growing up because we just lived out in boondocks and a lot of books. So I read everything in the house. I, I have distinct memories of reading Persuasions though. So Persuasion. So that's kind of fun as we're um, going to be talking about the yeah. film adaptations. The first one that I read, at least in my memory, was Sense Sensibility. And I had, this was when I was going to community college. And so we had like a pretty long winter break. It was like a month. It was a long, long break. And I read Sense Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice and I think Emma all in one and that break. I just went on like a... <laughs> <laughs> a binge fest I guess you'd say because yeah. uh, I just really really enjoyed them so much and uh, I know I'd gone to see the Sense Sensibility movie and I'm not sure if that uh, inspired me to to read it read the book but uh, but yeah I just loved the romance in her books I loved the witty banter uh, the characters and I think sometimes that her characters are actually kind of underappreciated for how rich they are and uh, that because I don't know I just think it's for whatever reason our society discounts you know things that are like considered sort of romantic fiction uh, rom-coms you know whether it's movie or books uh, but I mean someone like Lizzie Bennett is such a an elect uh, someone like Lizzie Bennett is such a layered and interesting character. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're still reading and making movies and from these books years and years later, they it's the characters I feel like. And I would say also Jane Austen's like ability to paint those characters mm -hmm. and make them say just the right things at just the right time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. She's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Persuasion is an interesting book from her because I feel like it works really well as a book and we'll talk about it more, but I, I don't know if it necessarily actually works that well as a movie. I, I don't think it's the most cinematic of books. And so far, I mean, I've liked at least aspects of the movies that we've gotten, uh, but I, I don't think we've gotten like the iconic 
perfect version of persuasion. I've, maybe we're just very picky because I totally agree. And it's like, <laughs> I could take some things from one film and others from another. Yes. Maybe all combined, we could come up with one. But yeah, I feel like each one of them just kind of missed something for yeah. me. Perfect. But I still just love watching them. I don't know. <laughs> it was it's fun. Kind of rewatching all of these and watching the new one. Like it, it was really, it was really a fun Mm-hmm. little project that you had me do. Oh, thanks. I mean, I, I think that Emma is probably actually, I think her most cinematic book because easiest to translate because it's the one that has the most banter between our two leads, uh, because they're friends from the very beginning, uh, yeah. and we see them fight and we see them. Whereas her other books, a lot of the times in Jane Austen, uh, there's surprisingly little romantic dialogue in her books, which they're not together a ton or if they're yeah. just, they're talking to each other because you couldn't spend too much time with one person at that time without right. You were suddenly engaged or should be engaged <laughs> danced one more time. Than you should have at a ball or something. Mm-hmm. So. Well, and something like in Pride and Prejudice, when Darcy's proposing, it says, it's, she says something to the effect of Darcy said what was appropriate for a man desperately in love. And you're like, no, I want to hear what he said. <laughs> and yeah. Emma's the only one that like spells that out, that has the proposal, that has the, you know, the actual sort of romantic dialogue. Everything else is kind of more sort of s- subdued. And then you get the, uh, you get the inner thoughts, inner workings, and then also the like, po- not political satire, but uh, satire of the day. And, and so that all works really well, but I think especially in persuasion, it's so much of it is based on what happened in the past and her thinking about what happened in the past. And then also, uh, what's she's thinking about in her head about everything and her worries. And there's really not that much time spent with Anne and Wentworth and, uh, so I think it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's very tough to, to make it to a, a movie. Yeah, and I feel like both the 2007 and the 2022 version really tried to like talk us through her mm-hmm. internal in different ways, a little bit, but kind of similar and to varying degrees of success, mm-hmm. I would say. We yeah. Look more specifically, I'm sure when we get to the different versions. I mean, I would be curious to see a Colin Firth uh, and uh, Colin Firth style Pride and, uh, Pride and Prejudice, that like n- meticulous detail to the actual novel. I would mm-hmm. love to see that as pers- done with persuasion. Not as it would Colin Firth, but you know, that, that Pride and Prejudice, which is so accurate to the book. Uh, I would love to see that but done with persuasion. We have never, well, I haven't seen that there's a version from the eighties for BBC. So maybe that one is, but I haven't seen it, but, uh, but I, I would love to see like a really faithful version. Yeah, like a four part mini. Yes. Where they can really actually take the time that they need to get all the key scenes. Mm-hmm. Away. <laughs> yes. We'd like to take a second from this episode of the podcast to celebrate our sponsor of this episode, and that is the Hallmarkies Patreon. Do you love Hallmarkies podcast? Do you want an inside scoop into what happens on the podcast? Do you want early access to episodes and loads of cool perks? Now is the time to become a patron of Hallmarkies podcast. By becoming a patron, you get to access our patron Facebook group. You can request episodes or even be a guest on the podcast. And most importantly, any patron can join our monthly movie watch-alongs with stars like Paul Campbell, Natalie Hall, and more. It's as low as $2 a month to join in and become a special part of the Hallmarkies family. Please consider, and we will love you forever. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. Let's talk about the adaptations. So we start out with 1995. This stars Amanda Root and Kieran Hines. And it has Samuel West playing Mr. Elliot, which is really fun. If you, uh, if you watch All Creatures Great and Small, which I highly recommend that you do, it's a very good show. 
and Samuel West is in that show uh, and he's played he, um, a, he's, he plays James Harriet's boss basically on the show and it's such a charm a, such a charming show I really uh, recommend it if you haven't seen it it's on PBS well he's working in that one and I do need to I need to watch that yeah he plays Siegfried is his name and uh, it's really good uh, so I highly recommend it but anyway um and and also Syrian Hines if you watch last year's Belfast he was nominated for an Oscar for that he played the grandpa in that and he's uh, it's a very charming sweet movie uh, that I think our, our audience would really enjoy um Amanda Root I haven't seen in a ton she was on I think she was in Cranford and some other BBC stuff uh but um what was your overall thought of this version Overall, I liked the attention to detail in this one. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. It, Mm -hmm. it I think I watched this second. I watched Modern Persuasion first because I hadn't ever seen that one. Uh Uh, And it it was a good one to watch after Modern Persuasion because it kind of jogged in me all the things that had happened in Modern Persuasion that I hadn't realized were connected to the film. Mm. (laughs) A little bit different, but I was like, yeah. That like swing in the pendulum. This one I felt like was very accurate. I really liked Amanda Root in it. I thought she did like an excellent job of portraying um, Anne Elliot. I had a harder time with Siren Hines. Like I didn't get the chemistry between them for some reason. Yeah. Stiff for me. And I felt like there were not maybe as many interactions between them that I wanted to see like like it just it felt they relied too much on us maybe knowing the story and knowing that they're made for each other without like showing us that they were made for each other like yeah this one I ranked a little lower because when I was talking about um that connection I I didn't actually feel as emotionally connected to this version of persuasion despite some of the beautiful things it did yeah, I agree. I do think the chemistry is not the best between the two of them. I, I think Sarah Hines is, is really good as Wentworth, but uh, but the two of them together, just not feeling it. There's just not that like smolder kind of underneath of what you want for these two characters. Uh, I do think that this version does the letter writing by far the best yes. of any of them. Yes. I 100% agree Mm -hmm. because they show him they're writing and he can overhear them talking, saying her and Benick talking about, uh, how, uh, she's, you know, she's saying, well, women love longer when all hope is gone. (laughs) Yeah. And, And uh, I really wanted to read the, read the book because it, I know I've read it twice, mm -hmm. (laughs) but I can't remember the last time I read it. And so I really wanted to reread it. I think I know fairly well which movies are pretty accurate to the book or not, but I believe that is how the scene happens in the book. Yeah. No, it is how it happens in the book. And then each one of these other ones, they they don't actually show them writing him writing the letter, which I think you miss out on that tension building, you know, because oh, yeah. he's sitting there in the corner writing, writing, writing. Yeah. I knew that he's listening and writing and mm-hmm. yeah. No, I, I, I 100% agree with that. It's one of the best scenes of the book and they did do it best in the mm-hmm. night. And I like the whole backdrop that they have here of the circus being in town. You see it a couple times before the, the finale, but I like the idea of them becoming engaged basically in what this circus going around behind them. I just, I think it's a lovely thought of them being kind of so in their bubble that they don't even hear a literal circus surrounding them. I loved that too. And I I didn't notice it throughout the movie. I only noticed at the end. So that's interesting that. um, I feel like it was there a few other times. And I just didn't notice it. But I remember at the end just feeling like it was a great juxtaposition of like something loud, Mm -hmm. noisy and flashy. And then this quiet love that had taken eight years to fully blossom. Mm -hmm. I did think that was beautifully done. Yes. Yeah. Because I feel like sometimes with Austin, uh, the, the Austinite crowd, 
they are so loyal to the book that they don't allow the directors to have any leeway for some artistic expression for some. And sometimes they go too far and I will talk about that, but I feel like this is certainly a fine uh, and kind of nice uh, artistic touch to the story to have this circus going around and around them. Yes. I liked that too. Yeah. I didn't the end but I really loved it at the end yeah and I I like the fact that uh you know you just really see the awkwardness between the two of them and maybe that hurts the chemistry a, a little bit but like when he comes to give the message about uh his about Kelly Lynch and he yeah. thinks that she's engaged that whole scene is is really well done she's just like ah <laughs> yeah and I, it, think that's good. I, I feel like those are like the crucial moments of persuasion like these moments that are just awful for these characters mm-hmm. and they yeah and um I appreciate some of the films didn't really even do that scene yeah and that was that was missing out I think if you didn't take advantage of such a good scene in the book. yeah I also think that Sophie Thompson is pretty funny as Mary Oh, uh, I have a picture of the cast because <laughs> that would be so helpful for me. <laughs> well, Mary is, you know, her sister and she's yeah, always thinking she's sick and she's you know kind of freaking out about her kids and, and all this stuff. And I, I think, I thought she was pretty funny. She is Emma Thompson's sister, Sophie Thompson. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, Mary's character is just fun always. And I, I think I liked the Mary in pretty much. All, and they yeah. all have a different take on it, but mm-hmm. um, it's such a fun character. And same with her dad, um, Sir Elliot, definitely yeah. a character that it was, I felt like in some ways they steal the show. Mm-hmm. In other ways, I'm like, I think they're fairly, I don't know if they're easy to play necessarily, but they're fun to play, I would guess, as an actor. Yeah, here's an interesting question. So the main goal in these Austin novels is for the, the heroines to end up married, right? Fall in love, get married. But the interesting thing is that almost all, there's a few exceptions, but almost all married people, married couples in Austin's novels are terrible, (laughs) like terrible (laughs) marriages, terrible. Um, I mean, there's a few, like the, the Westons and Emma, or um, the gardeners in Pride and Prejudice. And, but for the most part, they're just these terrible couples. And uh, I'm just curious why you think she did that. I think one theme of her books in general is, uh, I mean, marrying for love, correct? Mm-hmm. So I think she had to show what happens when you don't marry for love. And I think a lot of these unhappy marriages, you see that in this one, Mary. Well, Charles first wanted to marry Anne, you know, yeah. he was attracted to Anne first and, and then went for, settled for something else because you just have to get married, you know? So I feel like most of the unhappy marriages were done almost transactionally. I don't know that, um, that the Bennets were that way as far as like when they got married necessarily. Mm-hmm. And they definitely don't strike me as like the happiest of couples. Right. <laughs> but yeah, the Bennets um the collinses are like fine i guess but um uh, i'm trying to think other <laughs> the uh um i mean pretty much every uh every book has sort of the toxic couple <laughs> that's terrible yeah. <laughs> but way to make sure we know that true love is important <laughs> yeah. It does paint quite the contrast between, I mean, cause you think surely she doesn't believe that our heroines, I mean, if, if, if Lizzie Bennett is strong enough to refuse someone like Darcy, that when she finally does get a, a good match with ironically Darcy, uh, you think it's, she's probably going to be happy because she had the guts to, to not go for the easy choice. Uh, one interesting thing I, I was actually talking with um, my friend Melissa about uh, this, about Jane Austen and Austen adaptations. And she made the comment that 
that so many of these, whether it's, whether it is persuasion or Emma or different versions of Pride and Prejudice, that everybody wants the characters to be Lizzie from Pride and Prejudice. Uh, and you certainly see that we'll talk when we talk about the 2022 persuasion. Um, and I do think that that is a thing that even within versions of Pride and Prejudice, where you see that they try so hard to make all of the sisters all like Lizzie, and you're like, no, we need the difference. <laughs> it's kind of like, I've seen that with also with Little Women. There's some versions where every character feels like Joe. And it's like, no, we need different characters. That's what makes the book good. Uh, but have you, have you noticed anything like that? So uh, it, it's really funny. And I don't know if we want to talk about this more when we get to 2022. But when I saw the trailers for 2022, I felt like they were trying to make it like Emma, like the most recent, mm -hmm. which I loved and was so fun. But then when I watched it, I was su pleasantly surprised that, that I do not think they did that. I, I, mm -hmm. honestly, I don't feel like it was a copy or a style or sense of the new Emma. Yeah. So I was kind of more thinking that way, but as soon as they, as soon as you said in a message or something that you felt like everybody was trying to make all of her characters like um, Elizabeth, I was like, oh yeah, they yeah. did do that. <laughs> but yeah. I wasn't <laughs> watching for it. And so I was more watching for, is it like Emma? And it was And then when you said that, I was like, that is correct. She was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in my little order system that I had, I gave this one a five out of 10 for Anne. Cause I, I just felt like Amanda Root was kind of flat for me. Like she just, I mean, it is supposed to be kind of sort of a subtle, more quiet character, but I don't know. I didn't love her portrayal. I did go high on Syrian Hines for Wentworth. I gave him an eight because I, I thought he was really strong and you could feel like the tension and the sadness and the anger uh, and so I gave that an eight I did give it an eight as far as story I think it stays pretty close to the book uh, yeah. so you know it's a great book so that's a win um, and then the filmmaking like I said I thought it had really lovely moments like with the circus and uh, and uh, some other scenes so I gave it a seven as far as filmmaking so uh, all together uh, it's, um, let's see here. All together, it had 28, 28 points. Um, so. so, so I didn't, I should have done like numbers like that, but it's funny to me that I would flip the characters and I would give Amanda more of an eight and Siren more of a five. I, <laughs> and I might be totally biased by the mm -hmm. fact that I went and watched um, right. Jane Eyre after this. And, and I probably knocked down Siren's a little bit more on persuasion after seeing him in that because- Oh, he's, yeah, that one's not, not great. Him as Mr. Rochester, like I, anyway, I will not go yeah. into that talking about Jane Eyre, but <laughs> it probably made me a little bit like, oh yeah. And now that I think about it, he's, he kind of bothered me in persuasion too. <laughs> but. <laughs> bother me is I what luckily I watched persuasion first and so like it I do think like he captured a lot of the Wentworth stuff and and did a good job mm -hmm. uh, so I I would but I still would say I I liked Amanda Root just a little bit better mm -hmm. also this is kind of funny coincidence <laughs> about um I think it's this version um is it this version that um, okay. I'm going to have to come back to this. <laughs> I, That's okay. I'm... Um, yeah. If y'all want more of my thoughts on, on Jane Eyre, all the different adaptations, we did a ranking of that with my friend, Jen Johans in May. And that was really fun. And we, so we talked about his Kieran Hines version of Jane Eyre, but, uh, so it, it ended up with 28 points for me, but like I said, I think the highlight of this movie was the letter writing scene. It's very good. Okay, I know what I was going to say. Sorry, it's not this version. It's just, it's just that Siren Hines plays Rochester in Jane Eyre and Rupert Prenry Jones plays um, St. John in that version of Jane Eyre. So I thought that was the funny connection. Oh, I... you know what's funny? I remember saying in our recap saying like the uh, 
saying the Sinjin was pretty dreamy in that version. <laughs> yeah, and it's dreamy. Yeah, so that's that was my connection. I'm like, there was a connection between these movies <laughs> when I watched them right in a row, and that right. was it. Yeah, so isn't that funny? That is funny, uh, and I think that in the 1996 version of Jane Eyre that uh Samuel West plays Sinjin so oh all kinds of connections going awesome. on. Yes. Uh, but really you should watch all creatures great and small it's so good uh, <laughs> so t- uh, let's move up to the 2007 version and this stars Sally Hawkins and Rupert Henry Jones <laughs> he said and this version, I think, has much better chemistry than the previous version. And uh, it, it takes a few liberties. I think some of them are a little overblown by the Austinite people. Like they make a big deal about him buying Kelly Lynch Hall. And I get it. I guess that wouldn't be possible during that time. But uh, I didn't care. I thought it was fun. I thought it was a, a sweet moment for them. Um and nice for her to be able to go back there. I guess I was able to suspend disbelief. Maybe they're just lend, lending or like uh, renting it like the Admiral. Was. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> hey, I mean, he does say it's a present, but. Yeah, know, I was fine with that. I don't know. <laughs> it, it didn't bother me. <laughs> it didn't bother me either. I actually sat there and went like, is that Kelly Inch? And then I was like, I think it is. And I'm like, that's not possible, but oh well. <laughs> Yes. Uh, but like I said, they do not have the letter writing scene, which I think was a big mistake. Uh, she, she goes to see him and uh, the, one of the, the guys was there. Oh, take this letter. I was supposed to deliver it to you. Um, so then she reads it and then she runs. And that's another thing people, oh, she would never run through the city. I'm like, come on. You got a little bit of interpretation and you know the director's trying to build suspense and you know kind of get you invested uh, well, I didn't have any problem with her running I don't have a problem with her running either and I don't think that's historically inaccurate would a lady run through the streets no but would a lady who was just proposed to by a guy she waited eight years for a run through a street yeah. how can you say that she wouldn't you know like I was it improper sure but like, do we do improper things sometimes? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> so well, it that's wasn't a funny thing to me where people are like, oh, they would never. And I'm like, okay, yes, it was improper, but people don't mm-hmm. always, always do exactly what's proper. Right. Right. Well, yeah. And it's not like she had really any ties to Bath or cared about Bath. She didn't even like Bath. So is, that makes it extra likely that she would forgo those kinds of traditions yeah. rules anything I feel like if you know that she wouldn't run through bath that makes it more um of a dramatic scene to me mm-hmm. of yes she shouldn't be running through the streets but she is because yeah. she can't help herself she's gonna go get her man finally so yeah. that doesn't bother me at all even from a historical point of view yeah. I don't I, I don't I can't say that's inaccurate I I, I understand that it's unlikely that someone would do that in a normal circumstance, but she wasn't in a normal circumstance. So mm-hmm. that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. She's my favorite. Sally Hawkins is my favorite. And I, I mean, I just love her so much as an actress in general. Uh, I mean, I can't think of when I've ever seen her give a bad performance, whether it's the shape of water or Francis Ha or the Paddington movies. Uh, she's just always, great (laughs) and I think she's really good here I really uh I really like her performance I think that she there's more sort of nuance to her performance she's she is shy but she's not afraid to also then speak her mind on occasion like when her um father tries to tries to bully her into uh into not visiting her friend and you know she says she's like stands up to her dad then and says that uh that her friend is not the that only is not the only widow in Bath who is uh, who's lost their standing or whatever. Anyway, yeah. obviously criticizing her her dad for you know being in debt and losing the house and everything. Well, um, I think she's criticizing Mrs. Um, Clay at that point. Oh, 
I think she is also, yeah, that is a dig at Mrs. Clay, but yeah. also at her dad. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that, what do you think of Lady Russell? I feel like it's an interesting uh, character because uh, there's this like resentment there with Lady Russell, but obviously it is also, there's the surrogate mother thing. Uh, yeah, between. I think it's something that both the book and most of the movies portray fairly well, which mm-hmm. is that this is someone who influenced her in a way that has hurt her for the rest, for eight years, yeah. but they're all still good friends. And I think that's one of the things that I love about Jane Austen is that she has complicated relationships. And yeah. just because you have this one big problem from your past doesn't mean you're not friends anymore. So I, I just enjoy that in general from the story and in all the adaptations, I feel like that was done fairly well, mm-hmm. actually, that they, they still remain friends and she's still introduced, you know, like she'll still bring Lady Russell over to, to Captain Wentworth when she knows the history there, but she, it's, I, I kind of actually think that's one of the braver things that Anne Elliot does is she keeps her friendship with both of them, or she tries to, even though they were at odds. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the scene when, uh, that, uh, that, uh, where I love the scene where Lady Russell says to Captain Wentworth, that you have, have a way of upsetting my friend. And then, uh, and then Captain Wentworth says, and you have a way of influencing her. <laughs> that's, yeah. a good, that's a good scene. That's a good like they both love this woman. Yeah. Different ideas for what's right for her. Mm-hmm. And I do think there's something romantic, not only about second chance romance, but, in especially at this time where basically Anne was seen as an old maid at this point, like unmarriageable almost. And so the fact that Wentworth still thinks she's beautiful and is still in love with her, uh, is, uh, as a fellow old maid, I think it's, it's very romantic. <laughs> so I, this is, the, I'll bring this up now that these are the two distinct, um, memories I have of reading persuasion. The first time I read it, I was a teenager. I know because mm-hmm. I, was at home. I don't know how young, mm-hmm. um, but I don't think I was very good at connecting nuance that Jane Austen was so good at writing. Uh-huh. So I didn't love the story. I was like, it's a story of an old maid. <laughs> I just couldn't get beyond that. She was 27 years old. <laughs> like, like she just seemed old and dowdy and yeah, all her it. second bloom. I mean, Yes. But then I read it as an adult when I was probably closer to 27 and <laughs> realized that's not that old actually. And realized that just because her father was saying she wasn't very beautiful compared to her sister and himself or things like that like and definitely I don't think she's not good looking like I think she's always tried kind of portrayed that way in the movies but I feel like she lost her bloom at 18 and became an old maid almost right away you know Mm. like she did get another proposal from Charles but but then she gets it back too. And I, I, I don't, I, mm-hmm. I definitely fell in love with this book a lot more the second time I read it and was able to like catch the nuance mm-hmm. of she's, she just didn't seem that exciting to me as an 18 year old and yeah. I fell in love with her as an adult. And so I can understand why some people might feel this book is a little boring, is a little dry because it doesn't have the big moments of drama that you have with like Lizzie rejecting Darcy's proposal or, um, or Lydia going off to with Wickham or, you know, some of these like big dramatic moments you, that you have, uh, in some of the other books, uh, and it, it, we have, uh, Marianne and, and, uh, um, oh my gosh, my brain, we have the, you know, her whole drama going on, um, in Sense Sensibility, where uh, here it's all sort of more subtle. You have Louise Musgrave getting, you know, sick, falling. You have uh, them just meeting up at concerts and they're just not, it's not like the, there's not like the big drama that you have in some of the other books. Yeah, it has some of the elements of all of those, but they are more subtle. You have Mr. Elliot's a little bit scandalous for sure. But like, yeah, it's not quite the runaway with a young unmarried woman type Mm -hmm. scandal. Yeah, like they're like those elements are there, the fall, but not quite as dramatic as some of the other movies. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so I think that Rupert Henry Jones does the, I call it the long lingering look very well in this. That's a special, I think, British thing. Uh, oh, I mean, yeah. Colin Firth was obviously the best at this ever. So good uh, doing this. But in, in real life, it would probably be kind of weird to have this guy like staring at you like that. <laughs> but in the movies, it's great. And I think that he nails it. <laughs> Yes, Rupert Penry Jones. Oh my gosh. Like um he's a 10. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he makes this movie for me, honestly. Yeah. Like it's silly that that's what it comes down to almost for me, but yeah. the tension between these two is fantastic. Um he like I'm all on board the second he walks in the door. You know, mm-hmm. like there's something about him and the way he portrays mm-hmm. this Captain Wentworth that it, it didn't take much at all for me to just be like oh yes this is mm-hmm. this is my Captain Wentworth yeah so. yeah and I mean it's such a character piece that I think it can if it's since the characters are done well it that's a huge factor it uh, this is all about the characters not as much about like some amazing plot uh, and so I agree. I think both of them are really strong. I think they have really good chemistry. He does the, the long lingering look very well. Uh, so let's talk about the, the ending kiss. Cause I know that, that this is very controversial. Um, so they, they do stretch it out. The director stretches it out a long time. But the thing I like about that is that you see the tear coming down her cheek. Yeah. And, I just think that that's this, they've had so much together and they've had such a, uh, to get to that kiss has been such a journey yeah. that to see that tear come down, I think it's kind of sweet. Uh, maybe it's a tad too long, but it doesn't bother me the way that uh, I think it bothers you. I'm all about a long kiss. I'm, I'm great <laughs> with that. <laughs> I, I, I disagree that that was a long kiss. The kiss is like a split second at the end, <laughs> a very fair. long, almost kiss. And yeah, so I think we were texting about this and I just said, the kiss at the end is unforgivable. (laughs) Maybe that's a little harsh, but I think this movie was so brilliantly done, so beautiful in so many aspects. And I don't know too many people that watch that kissing scene and could be totally connected to the kissing scene Uh as much as they were just going like, wait, what are they going to, what? It is long. It really is long. So to me, it feels like it takes you out of the moment because of their directorial choices and to me that's just kind of unforgivable let us have that moment with them the other thing is you don't see him at all and so to me I would if I would like it better even if it was longer let's say even if you kept the before kiss part as long as you did I would shave it by a little bit (laughs) at Uh least (laughs) but then like show them kissing then show him looking at her a little bit or so I don't know like I'm sorry, I've got strong feelings about this. But <laughs> too, and I love the movie so much. And I don't mind the kiss that much, but that's not what I want to say about a kiss. You know what I right. mean? I can like, see what I you're saying. Even kissing scenes, they're very important to me. <laughs> but I do like that you just see that tear I do going like down her tear. cheek. So leave the tear, shape <laughs> a bit more, give us a look at him a little bit. He's been waiting for eight years for this too. Right. Let us see them actually kiss. Cause Mm -hmm. it's really the camera just boom stops almost as like the second their lips meet. I feel like, I mean, almost. So anyway, that's my, that's probably the biggest critique of the movie. And, but otherwise a very brilliant, brilliant film. So I give both Anne and Wentworth in this nine and then I give the story a seven. It's a little less, little less faithful than the 95, which I'd given an eight. And then I gave a six, the filmmaking. It doesn't have like any of the sort of creative touches, like with the circus and, and that kind of a thing. But um, it's, it is my favorite version. I gave it 31 points. So this uh, is my favorite too. Sorry, continue. Yeah. Um, so I quickly did my numbers and I gave Sally a nine. I gave Rupert a 10 because holy cow, I would give him 11. Um, story, I would say seven, a few little things were missed or not quite in the right place. Mm-hmm. And I liked the filmmaking on this one. And I, I, we talk a little bit about how this 
movie is hard to um, adapt because it's so internal. And mm-hmm. so this one did do some talking over and I almost- some narrator, like, yeah. Yeah, and, and she would look at the camera like, I think three times she looked at the camera um, at the very end. And I just thought Sally Hawkins like glance at the camera is so beautiful. And I think that gave, I liked how they did that. I feel like it, it, it gave us more of that feeling of the longing that happens in this book. But it was hard to do without it. Like the 1995 didn't do it. And, and mostly I don't like talkovers. Like I'm not necessarily mm-hmm. a fan of that in a movie, but I do feel like this movie, I think they almost needed it. So for that reason, I upped the, the filming to nine. I think that was a good use mm-hmm. of um, this talk over and, and like the way she looked at the camera here, there and wrote in her journals and things right, yeah. really well done to try. And like you said, this is a hard movie to adapt. I think that was, help, I think that mm-hmm. helped with adaptation for sure. Yeah. All right. So then we have 2020, we had a modern version called modern persuasion with Alicia Witt, uh, and Shane McRae and BB new worth. And, uh, this is, taking the story and placing it kind of like a business environment. And I actually think they got most of the beats of the story are in there, uh, which a lot of times for Hallmark, this wasn't for Hallmark, but it did feel like a made for TV movie, which I'm not opposed to. Obviously I have Hallmark podcast. (laughs) I'm fine with that, but um, it did feel that way. But uh, there's a lot of Hallmark movies that are that they give Jane Austen titles that have nothing to do with the stories of Jane Austen at all, which makes me crazy and I hate it. Yeah. But this one actually does have pretty much all of the beats of exactly. the story. Uh, she had rejected him. They had uh, been in in love in the past. He comes back into her environment. He's running basically the company that now she is uh, she's has, having to work with. So she's forced to work with him and, uh, and that you have basically, I, kind of, I thought it was creative that they had the, uh, the Musgroves where kind of the marketing, like modern marketing people in the office, the girls, that was funny to me. They have a Bennett character. Basically the dad, right? Mm-hmm. Like- yeah. Yes. Um, BB New Earth is basically Lady Russell and, yeah. uh, I, you know, I like Alicia Witt. I think she is a she can bring comedy into a scene. She has, uh, she does a lot with her face <laughs> comedy, her yeah. facial expressions and her mannerisms. And I actually thought that they had pretty decent chemistry and they, they changed the, um, the letter writing to a text message, which I think makes sense for a modern adaptation, but it's basically all there, the letter. Um, and they do reference the novel in the script uh, a number of times and you know the whole half agony half hope yeah um line they acknowledged that that was from persuasion which i thought was pretty clever and good i wasn't sold on that actually because in my brain if you're making a persuasion movie then your story is persuasion so it was a little hard Mm -hmm. like they didn't notice that they were living the book that they (laughs) Like that felt like weird to me. I'm like, okay, if this is like your book that you read together uh-huh. loved it, and you have some of the lines memorized, <laughs> like part of me wants to be like, no, just make those words your own word. Yeah. Ignore the book. Pretend like it's not in this reality. I don't know. Yeah. Was- I can see what you're saying. I, I kind of looked at it as, oh, like a, like a, an Easter egg kind of. I did like that it was an Easter egg. I just, it, it kind of threw me off a little. Too much. I can see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, on Letterboxd, the reviews on this are extremely harsh. And I, it, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's partly I'm just used to watching made for TV movies. And I've seen so many that are like said way worse and don't even have anything to do with the story at all. And, and so maybe I was kinder <laughs> to it than others, but, uh, but I don't thought it was cute I liked it (laughs) I did think it was cute and I actually I felt like the actors did a really great job the chemistry I totally was sold on who they picked to play pretty much every role Mm -hmm. really well done I felt like um after we watched so I watched this one first and then I watched the Amanda Root version 
And I realized my number one gripe with this one is I don't think that you can take her family relationship mm. family relationships and put it into the workplace and have the same effect on you. And yeah. so that, that's like a weird gripe, but no, I can <laughs> see that. Like, I actually don't know what else they could have done. I'm not trying to say they should have switched it. I think it's very creative the way they did it, but it took away so much of the drama because at some point you just quit that job. Yeah. <laughs> This is a family you can't, you know? Right. And, and I also feel like because of that, they had to soften, soften all the characters like Mary. Um, it's not Mary in this, but basically the pregnant mm-hmm. woman complains about being sick all the time. Well, it's not really a character flaw in this. It's more, she's pregnant <laughs> and she's not feeling great. And you kind of relate to her. Whereas like Mary is just like a ridiculous character, hyper, hypochondriac that's mm-hmm. very self-centered. And that just creates more drama. So I felt like yeah. by putting it into the workplace, first of all, it was a great idea. Like I, I love that they did that because it works really well for our modern times, but they lost a lot by doing that. They mm-hmm. just lost so much by doing that. And they had to soften all the characters. And instead of- and Maybe having- that's why they tried to bring in the actual story so that uh, that is a way of kind of almost acknowledging that they couldn't, tell all you know that they couldn't there's only so much that they could do within uh, a modern setting uh, is to tell this particular story but yeah I mean I think that's that is fair a fair critique and I you know they try to kind of make it so that they had they were kind of forced to working together again Uh, but yeah I think that uh, it's not the same as like your family and, and especially all the rules of marriage and uh, that were just part of Regency era that's just not a part of current era. It's hard to modernize that in the same way that you can with Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, exactly. The stakes just couldn't be as high the way they wrote it. And it would have been interesting to watch it not knowing the story of Persuasion yeah. and how much I liked it and didn't, but it just, it felt like it was missing mm-hmm. But I, I do think that the audience of this podcast that likes TV movies, that likes these kind of, I think that they will like this version. I really do. I liked it. I enjoyed yeah. watching it. And, and it was just interesting to me that I couldn't figure out what was like a little bit missing until I watched the other one. And I'm like, that's it. It's just that, that family is different than work, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so you, yeah, yeah. that's the, fair. That's fair. I, so I gave Anne, I gave her six. Um, and then Wentworth, I gave six and then the story, I also gave six and filmmaking, I gave a four. So it ended up with 22 points for me for this version. Like I can't really compare it that much to something like the 1995 version. Uh, but I think that if people listening to this podcast, look at the reviews on Letterboxd and other places and are like, oh, this is really terrible. Mm, I think you'll actually you might actually like it because it, I mean, let's be honest, most of those, most of those letterbox stuff are really hard on all Hallmark type content. Um, so I, I think, uh, that a lot of our audience will enjoy this film. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was close and a little bit different. I did seven and seven for the actors. I really liked them both. Um, yeah. and yeah, I got behind them really well. Mm-hmm. as actors. I did a three for the which the, the story, mm-hmm. uh, just because I felt like they needed to do something to up the stakes if they were going to lower them. And, mm. and then the a six for the filmmaking, I thought it was well filmed and yeah. Cool. Welcome to the Pilot Podcast. My name is BJ. And my name is Me Too. And we promise this promo is worth it. So please don't skip ahead. We're two judgy friends who put our judgmental skills to work for you. We review the pilot episodes of new and popular shows and shows that our listeners request to answer your question, should I watch this? Look, a lot of us are spending a lot more time at home, and yes, we should be reading and trying new projects and enriching ourselves, but does anything beat binging a great show? Let us take the guesswork out of deciding what your next show will be. Tune in to The Pilot Podcast at thepilotpodcast.com. This new version, 2022. Yeah. And I was very hyped for this movie. I was really looking forward to it all year. 
and when everybody else was freaking out about the trailer i was like just calm down give it a chance it, it'll yeah how bad can it be was <laughs> my my perspective and then i saw it and when i first saw it i was like oh well and then the more i thought about it the more i was like no i don't like that i don't like it at all <laughs> uh and i do think that they have the worst chemistry of any of these uh, the two leads with this as dakota johnson henry golding uh, Richard e. Grant plays her father and Cosmo Jarvis plays Wentworth and they have hardly shown him at all in the trailer and any of the marketing all you see is Henry Golding and you'd almost think that Henry Golding is Wentworth in this movie <laughs> which I don't know why they, they I think they should have done that but uh but they didn't instead he's Mr. Elliot and he's barely in the movie I mean and we'll talk more about that but but I just didn't think that this Wentworth and this Anne had any chemistry really at all what did you think i disagree about the chemistry i i mean i i don't think it was as good as rupert penry jones but mm. um, i i think i mentioned this before there's that flash from their previous relationship just for a second and that sold me a little bit on them just that little tiny snippet so i thought that was really well done um I do feel like they tried to modernize very much like the way you would interact with people in this, like, mm -hmm. Hey, let's actually talk, which Jane Austen didn't let her characters do super often because right. it was hard back then to have a conversation. So, um, and I'm not totally anti modernizing things. There were some things in this that bothered me, some things that didn't, I didn't hate that aspect of it. Like, okay, let's have a healthy relationship. And if we, haven't seen each other for eight years we can talk about it you know which is fine um I didn't I didn't love it necessarily but I didn't hate it so I I would say um I really liked his look I really liked her look I really mm -hmm. like I mean her hair down too much I don't love that but and we can get into com costumes later <laughs> but I just think like as far as like like the actors themselves I felt like I could get behind them, but maybe not quite as much chemistry as some of the others, but mm -hmm. I, I believed it. So, well, I have no problem with modernizing as well and creative takes. I mean, I really like love and friendship, which is almost nothing like the actual book, but it's witty enough and, uh, and kind of has a wicked sense of humor and the script is, is really good. So I enjoy that, but this one, I mean, they completely change Anne's character. I mean, it is almost nothing like the Anne Elliot from the book. And that's when I start to have problems. I mean, she's like a, a wine drunk for a lot of this movie. She's, <laughs> she's rebellious. She's, she's, uh, you know, speaking her mind at any, uh, any opportunity, which is just not this character at all. And that was frustrating to me all of the fourth wall breaks i pretty much thought were really annoying i didn't like that at all um and i they just again i don't mind creative touches but when you completely change the characters then why are you even making the movie at all yeah so and i i agree with a lot of these things so the fourth wall breaks i wanted to talk about that because in the sally hawkins i feel like they almost do that except mm -hmm. for it's talk over. And in here that she looks at us and tells us, yeah. and I think the Sally Hawkins was a much better way. I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to give us. So here's where I have issues with this new one. They're trying to give us some of Jane Austen words in my mind. That's the only reason to do that. Mm -hmm. But the, her talk overs weren't always just Jane Austen's words. Yeah. They were really different from Jane Austen's words. So I agree. Like, so one of my favorite adaptations of a Jane Austen novel is clueless. So right. I'm definitely okay with some different things, but, um, but I felt like they, they didn't, gosh, with the modernization of this one, it was too all over the place. Yeah. Um, it was, well, and don't you agree? Like fundamentally changing her character to be this like rebel and to, to be getting drunk all the time. Like what? Yeah. Yeah. The drinking was weird to me. Like Yes. She literally pours a bottle of wine on her head <laughs> at one point. And she's sneaking bottles of the wine up into her room. And she <laughs> basically, she says at the very beginning that she drank for the last eight years to get over it, <laughs> which I just, yeah. And 
Yeah. And the idea of them deciding to be friends midway through is like an interesting idea, but it takes away a lot of the tension of the scene because when it gets to the when it gets to the final scene, there's there's no doubt that she she is not going to be with Mr. Elliot at all. You have no doubt about that. And uh, and there's at that point. What's right? that? Doesn't he still think she's getting married at the end of this? Well, story? she does, but as an audience viewer, I have okay. no, there's, and obviously I know the story, but like there should be a certain degree of tension in that when the whole, the whole final letter, there should be some degree of tension of, you know, she's just thinking that he's engaged to someone else. He thinks she's engaged to someone else, uh, all of that. But because they had already had this whole conversation about, well, we agree to be friends. It just, I thought it lowered the stakes a lot. And it's not a story that has that much stakes to begin with. And so <laughs> I, 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 did, I didn't think it worked. Yeah. I didn't really think it worked, but I didn't mind that change as much as you, but also mm -hmm. as much as others changes that really were weird yeah. for me. Just well, and then make, like I said, Henry Golding is hard, as Mr. Elliot is hardly in the movie at all. And I think they were afraid to make him a bad guy. I don't know why. <laughs> and then the end, when they make his marriage, like a, <laughs> like a sign of, of true love conquers all. I was just like, what? Yeah. Now I'm never going to complain about Henry Golding being a movie. So <laughs> I even just having, I thought he was perfect for the role. I don't like how they ended. I agree with you about that. It's like, just leave him what he is and don't try and say like that was love at all because it wasn't. Yeah, he's not <laughs> a villain uh, hardly at all in this but, movie. And literally there's like a whole... Better. There's a whole narration over his wedding saying, don't be afraid to love whoever you want to love. Yeah, no, that part was weird about it, but I, I feel like that was tacked on. Like if you, if you could ignore that part, I think he played Mr. Elliot so well. And, um, this idea. Yeah. I, I, I loved him. I mean, Mr. I don't think this character was really like, he does a good job with this character. This yeah. character is not Mr. Elliot. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I mean, barely. I feel like at the end, definitely things changed in that like, he's a little bit better version of Mr. Elliot. But I think if you took out that last scene where he actually uh -huh. really likes Mrs. Clay, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> if, you had, if you kept it that he didn't like Mrs. Clay, no. but was just trying to um, stop his, like get his inheritance by stopping a marriage between Mrs. Mm -hmm. Clay and Mr. Elliot like, or Sir Elliot, then I feel like he's, he goes back to the original Mr. Elliot. The, yeah. the endings just did that. So if you take away that, I feel like it was a decent Mr. Er Elliot proposal, this charming, dashing man with secrets. And well, and actually they kept him rich too, which was not original, right? So, I mean, they, they mm -hmm. did a few things. Well, in the book, he has the it. appearance of wealth, but he yeah. actually isn't. And in here, I kept waiting for them to to, to discover that he's not actually wealthy and they don't like he, right. he is wealthy. So they, I feel like they took away a couple of things, like you said, to soften his character and make him not so much a bad guy. And I think they did that with almost every person in this movie a little bit, mm -hmm. a feeling of like, everything's okay. You know? And I think yeah. that's a modernization that we have too now that, you know, everybody should be good with who they are and we're not going to judge people for, not wanting to take care of their children and not, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, and marrying someone in order to stop someone else. Well, and from, that is, know. that is something that I've said about the 2005 Pride and Prejudice a lot. Cause I, I feel like that movie takes everything in the book and kind of takes it down a notch. Like really the Darcy in that movie is kind of just shy. He's not even that much of a jerk. He's just kind of awkward. <laughs> um and uh like her mom isn't that over the top like just all the everything's kind of taken down a notch which i'm okay with but uh in this i just felt like they then they pushed it too far even for me uh yeah. that like again making her a drunk making her a rebel um making mr elliot the happy ending of the story <laughs> like i'm <laughs> but um but i you know there were moments that i liked i even though i didn't think they had the greatest chemistry the 
the kiss at the end I thought was well done. And, uh, there was a sense of like taking a deep breath and be like, finally for both of them, which I thought was nice. Uh, and I also thought that Mary was pretty good uh, that in this, um, so I liked that. I liked the diversity in the casting. You could definitely feel a big time Bridgerton influence on this movie. I don't know if have you, what did you watch Bridgerton? I watched most of the first season. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty spicy. So I wouldn't be I surprised. Book, so I know. I know oh, what I know. Okay. Good. Yeah. So I read the book years ago. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. well, you could just feel like in the music choices that felt very Bridgerton y to me and, but not as effective. Um, I didn't really love the music in this. And then also in the costuming, you could feel Bridgerton influence because Bridgerton, I mean, you've seen it, it's kind of all over the place, but like, because Bridgerton is fictional, I'm like more willing to take like a leap of whimsy, I guess, with it. Um, because they mix like the, the queen is wearing, like, looks like she's in like Mozart time and, and then. Uh, the others are sort of sort of regency sort of not it's kind of all over the place but um in this it was really all over the place there were clothes that i mean i'm no expert but there were clothes that looked very like victorian um times where she was wearing like a shirt and a skirt yeah they almost look like civil war time um and then times when she was wearing more of the typical empire waist kind of look yeah and the hair was a mess <laughs> Well, it's interesting to me that it's always the main character that they do this with. And when, because mm-hmm. I think they just want them to feel connected to us. I don't know, but I feel like most of the other costumes were more accurate than Anne's. Um, and then, yeah, yeah you have everybody in this Regency clothing, and then Anne's wearing basically a white blouse with a skirt that comes to her waist, not, it's not high. Yeah, it looked like. <laughs> A totally that different era 1940s almost to me you know like one of them yeah uh, so yeah so I'm gonna be kind of this is where it gets very tricky for me because it becomes art right and yeah. I thought Bridgerton was an artistic masterpiece I will be mm-hmm. honest it's too spicy for me personally yeah but the clothing and I loved the music choices in it yeah, the way they changed them and and you noticed it and you appreciated it that's how I felt about it this one, it felt like they wanted to do it, but they didn't do it artistically enough for right. me. I don't know. And art is so, um, what's the word? Like, it's so hard for me to explain. Well, I mean, Richardson is trying to embrace the sort of bodice ripper kind of uh, Harlequin, you know, kind of bring in that whole part of it, which I think uh, it adds a little bit of camp, a little bit of yes. that kind of factor to it all. It's so all you want clothing that's kind of embraces that as well. Mm-hmm. Whereas this, there's really, aside from the like drinking and there's, there's, and even that, that's not really like camp. And so it's like oh, trying I- to combine this like indie sensibility. It's something you see at Sundance or whatever yeah. with like Jane Austen and it's just, and then bringing in some Bridget too. And it just doesn't really work as like a voice and an artistic expression, like you're saying. Yeah. I, I feel like, so in Bridgerton, it added, I yeah. feel like this movie, it took away. Okay. There were places like he's a 10. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And That's true were, about the script. If you were in six in London or whatever it was, you're a 10 you're, in Bath, you're a 10 in Bath or, or you're 10 in London, you're 16 in Bath. Like these, these modern phrases. And the thing is they were just thrown in at times. Yeah. Um, and there, that's just one example. I thought I wrote down a couple more. Yeah. Where she says, I'm an empath at one yes. point. Yes. <laughs> very... and, oh, and then there was the, my doctor says that I should try to think of others or something like that. And like, doctors didn't do that back then. <laughs> right. Psychiatrist. And I'm like, I don't think, I don't think that was done back yeah, then. Yeah. Now we're worse than exes. We're friends. Yes. Exes. That's another one. I'm like, it's mm-hmm. like, it distract it it distracted me and detracted from Jane Austen's beautiful writing first of all and and like his letter was also changed and I'm like how do you change yeah and to something she, he says something like because your love has not lasted as long as mine which isn't a bad 
sentence. And I'm sorry if Jane Austen wrote that one. I didn't go back and check, but I am almost 100% sure yeah. he did not say that in that letter. And it just was like, you're, you're throwing in, someone's trying to up Jane Austen and they're not mm-hmm. doing it. They're yeah. not doing it. Why would you change things like that? So that's yeah. where I struggled with it is it wasn't consistent enough or artistic enough to add to the movie. It only detracted it. It only detracted for me. Mm-hmm. So. I agree. And I mean, there's that whole scene where she gets jam on her face. You're just like, what is happening? Which was less bad than I thought it was going to be because that was in the trailer. And that was my first inkling. <laughs> of like, They're just going to try and make this a comedy like, like Emma and Emma's mm-hmm. a comedy. And, and this is not a comedy. This is a book about longing and yeah. awkward moments. And, and, and that scene wasn't as bad as I thought to be. Mm-hmm. I think because I'd been given some warning that they were <laughs> not going to do that scene traditionally. It's still, it's still, yeah, it still didn't quite capture yeah. what you'd hope. And I was bummed because I was ready to fight for this movie. I was ready to be like, no, it's, you know, for all the people who were like, they changed this, they changed this. So I was ready to be like, no, it's, it's, it's good. You know, like I, I feel like I defend the 2007 one a lot, um, from people that don't want, like I said, don't like the running or, you know, it's like, come on, you gotta have some, some, uh, artistic expression from the director, but I couldn't in the end, I couldn't. So that was a bummer. Uh, so I gave the, I gave Anne, and also I thought it was weird that they didn't even try to give her a British accent. I, that, that's something I honestly didn't really know like I at one point was trying to figure out <laughs> that <laughs> she would say a couple of words I feel like in a British uh-huh. she wasn't full-on I don't know yeah but that's it weird as much as it does some people <laughs> but I gave Anna too I just didn't work for me the the whole drinking thing especially I just didn't like that Wentworth I gave a three the story I gave a four because the basic bones of the story are in there, them not, you know, them breaking up and getting forced back together. And, you know, they're there and those bones worked, I guess. But, um, uh, and then the filmmaking, I gave a five. Because there were some like nice moments, like I said, the, the kiss at the end, the way that was filmed was nice. Um, I'd be interested to see other things uh, maybe that this director did. Maybe I might like those better. Um, but I ended up with only 14 for this one. Yeah. Pretty low. So this one's harder for me to rank like that because I don't mind the actors they picked for Anne and mm-hmm. um, Frederick. Like, I actually really think they are great actors. I think they were yeah. given a script that was impossible. So yeah, no, I, I agree I, actually with I, that. I feel like I can't really rate them because I, I actually enjoyed their acting. I enjoyed mm-hmm what they did with the script they had and I enjoyed the chemistry so I still really enjoyed this movie um I think you have to go into it knowing you're going to be disappointed with some things but like if friends want to go out and see it again I would be like so on the ball with that like because honestly as someone who writes these types of books what we want is for these movies to be successful and we're hoping that this will be something that people just really latch on to um, because it's such a fun time period. Yeah. So I still, um, I still, I still felt an emotional connection to this movie more so than I would say the 1995 or the modern persuasion. So I actually ranked it a little higher just for that. But if, if I separate it, like you are, it's going to come out really low, but I, because I'm basing like more on enjoyment attachment to it. I think mm-hmm. they did some good things in this movie that I still really enjoyed mm-hmm. and and loved the characters and stuff, even though they weren't the characters from the book. (laughs) Fair enough. I can see that. Uh, So I will give my ranking. My final ranking is I have 2007 at number one. I have 1995 at number two. I have modern persuasion at three and I have 2022 at four. Okay. So I did, and this is not based on your separated. This is like basically 100% on how much emotional attachment I felt to the film as I was watching it, how much enjoyment I got from watching it. And I went with 2007 as one. So we can agree there. Mm -hmm. I actually put the new one at number two because I really felt attached to the characters. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed it. 
Um, and then persuasion, 1995, I put it number three. And those are really close, the two and three. Honestly, mm -hmm. that that's a hard one for they're me. They're pretty different. It's it's because almost they're very to different. Compare. And I prob like as someone who loves Jane Austen, I probably should have ranked higher the fact that Persuasion 1995 did just a better job with the story for sure. But I'm just that's really just me basing on a, which ones I really, really just felt attached to as I was watching them. Yeah. I do say, fun. I would say that I do think the 1994, 1995 version is a little more dry than yeah. even 2022 yeah. because yeah. it's so like insane what the choices they made. Like, so it's, it's sometimes frustrating, but it, I can see why you would say that. I can see that. Yeah. So, and then I put modern persuasion number four. I didn't, I, I liked all the movies. I liked all of yeah. them. That one, the most I felt a little bit detached from what was going on. I didn't mm -hmm. feel the drama. I didn't feel like the longing mm -hmm. quite as much as the others. So that was my final ranking. I think that's good. Well, let us know if you're listening, what you think and what you would rank these four movies. And uh, you, you can stream most of them except for 2007. You have to have BritBox <laughs> to, to stream it. Our number one. <laughs> but if it, if you, I'm sure that if you go to your local library, they will have the 2007 one. So I would check that out there. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, these let us know your ranking of these four. We'd love to hear that. I think you can watch the uh, Modern Persuasion on Tubi free. So that's nice too. But, uh, but again, let us know what you think of these versions. We'd love to hear it. And uh, Esther, where can people find you? I am on Instagram as author Esther Hatch. I have a podcast called Between the Lines with three other authors that write wholesome type romances and um and also on Facebook as author Esther Hatch. So those are right. the you have a new book coming out. I have a Christmas collection coming out oh, okay. soon, and I will have a second book coming out in December this year. Oh, okay, great. Nice. great. Very good. Uh, and we'll put a link to our affiliate link for Amazon for Esther's books. So you should check that out and, and uh, you should check out Jane Austen, of course. Sure. <laughs> Always a great time to, and we're going to be doing for our, for our uh, monthly uh, romance reading recap, we're going to be doing persuasion this month. So that's going to be super fun. So you want to read up on your uh, persuasion, uh, but uh, you can find me at Rachel's reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. And I'll put my link to my review for the latest persuasion uh, in the description, uh, but make sure you're following the podcast on Hallmarkies Pod and Hallmarkies Podcast, all of our social media. And if you are listening on iTunes, please leave us your ratings and reviews, five stars. It really helps us so much. And if you are listening on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that so much. We also have our patron group and merch store where we have some Austin inspired merch in the merch store. So check that out. And uh, thanks again. This was really fun to get to talk about these movies and uh, we'll talk to y'all later. Bye everyone. Bye.